Hello and welcome to KennyRoy.com. I'm Kenny Roy. This is the lecture for the month of June 2013 and it is called Animating with Tempo. Now this is something that you probably have not heard of before. Uh, it's because I made it up. Uh, I'm making it all up. We're just going to fly by the seat of our pants today. Um, no, seriously, this is actually something that um, has been brewing and stewing inside of me and part of the wonder of animation is that you can kind of discover new things as you're going along. Even at my point in my career, there are new discoveries to be made. I, and I think that we are all, all always learning. Okay, so this is something that's ongoing and it's really, um, it's really just a, a growing art and there's still a lot of discoveries to be made. So um, I'm trying my best to discover, you try your best to discover, um, we'll all uh, advance the art together. But um, back to our topic today, animating with tempo. Um, I'm trying to actually, if you could help me out, I'm trying to actually coin that term, okay, animating with tempo. It's kind of like Mike Matisse drawing with force. You know, everyone associates force with Mike Matisse. I'm trying to get this concept um, kind of out there because I, I really, well, first of all, I do think that is a brand new concept that is um, actually very interesting. Um, but um, I'm also trying to um, see if, if, if this is the kind of concept that can really like help a lot of people turn a corner. So um, if you can spread this around, um, after you watch this lecture, you know, tell your friends about it. Even if they're not KennyRoy.com members, you know, teach them. Um, and that's a side point that I want to make, is that in animation, like I've had this new discovery about animating with tempo, right? In animation, I, I've, I've had, you know, different stages where I have multiple discoveries and like I, I feel like I, I you know, you, you hit it and then you tr try to ride that as long as you, you can and discover a new thing and go even further, right? Um, there, there are always discoveries to be made, but they are made <laughs> normally when I am teaching, okay? And so that's the point I wanted to make. Um, this goes all the way back to the articles that I've been writing about giving feedback and how giving feedback is actually a really um, selfish thing to do. You may think that when you're giving feedback that the person that you're giving feedback to and you're critiquing their shots, like you're doing all the work and they're just like coming and like mooching your time and it's just like, you know, they're, they're benefiting the entire time. Absolutely wrong. You are benefiting just as much, if not more, than they are when you give critique. Why? Because you are having to put into words your workflow. You're having to find the vocabulary and actually express these sort of like innate things that you feel about animation and how you do it. And the more you do that, the better your workflow is going to be, okay? So you know I'm all about workflow. I'm all about knowing your own process. So it's just, it's, it's interesting to me that all of these discoveries come when I'm teaching. So animating with tempo um, has, I, I've, I've, for, for about a year now, I've tried to put into words what this, uh, what this thing is and then finally now I'm able to express it because we're in the middle of collabs and having the students here and having to uh, basically express this thing that I've never been able to before has made it so that I, I finally I found the words okay and that this is very exciting to me and this is very and I hope it's interesting to you so we're going to talk about what animating with tempo is right now when you are animating, most of your guys' workflows uh, revolves in some way around animating with stepped keys in the beginning and blocking out basically your poses and having those pretty good poses be sort of the thing that drives the animation. What do I mean by that? So you thumbnail and you come up with these really strong poses and if, if you can, you're trying to make it so that the, the, the poses really come through and then you are kind of timing those things sort of like the, the, way, the, the, the way they first like intuitively work, okay? What to me, what that, what the result of that is that we don't actually end up getting the real strength, the real seed of that brilliance in the animation because you are sort of neglecting movement, okay? You're all about pose 
And the result of that is that when it goes by, when the animation goes by, right, who knows like where like actually in your animation all of those amazing poses come out. Now don't get me wrong, I am all about really strong pose. I, it, it's very super important to me as it should be to you. At the same time though, you kind of get pose for free because there's no restrictions on pose when you're coming up with pose. But the timing of your animation is going to be the thing that actually inspires the audience. The, 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 the new timing, the, the unrealistic timing, the, the sort of cartoony timing, all of those things, okay? So what animating with tempo means is it means getting to those timing choices as quick as you can. And then when you're there making those timing choices, it means taking only like sort of like doing triage, sort of deciding which of these moments are the absolute essential moments that define the timing and then going overboard with the with the size of it with like either the pose or the position of of the character okay so if it's a bouncing ball all right then how do you define a bouncing ball you need at least because our minds can fill in the rest right because our minds when we look at step keys we can fill in the rest so you need at least that start position that end position and wherever the top of the arc is going to be. You can watch that, right? As animators, you, we all have good taste and we can all fill that in. We see it here, we see it here, and our mind just fills in the blanks and then it comes back down and we see it here, right? The only thing, and think about this example and, and then you'll start to see what I mean by animating with tempo. The only thing that determines if those three positions, right, start, end, and the apex, right, the only thing that determines if these are correct is the timing, right? Think about it. If you, you, there's, there is an arc that exists that goes through with like the perfect parabola of any three points like this, here, here, and here, you know, here, here, and, and way up here, all of those, the only thing that determines if that is like the correct or physically accurate or you know is going to look good is the timing. And so that's what I'm talking about. I sort of, this is part of how I came about this, about this concept, was I was thinking about a bouncing ball and I'll, I'll show you the, the, the shot, okay? But I was thinking about a bouncing ball and I kind of stripped away all of the pose and I asked myself well what would make this work well only a certain timing and then it dawned on me when we are animating if we can get to that that inspiring timing as fast as possible then our shot pretty much guaranteed for, for you know for the rest of its lifespan uh, working on it you're going to maintain a lot more of that inspiration than if you have like 20 amazing poses and then you try to sort them out, okay? So that, and, but let me say that this is a workflow. This is, it, this is definitely another workflow lecture, okay? That being the case, your workflow has to be your workflow. My workflow is my, my workflow. When you have a new idea or something that you think you wanna try out, then go ahead and do it, jump in, okay? So try this out. But this might not take over or replace your workflow at all. And it's not necessary to, and I'm not proposing that, that that's what we do. I'm just showing you a, a, brand new, uh, a brand new thinking that I have that I think really, really, really helps out. You will notice and I said I've been thinking about this for a year. You'll notice that there are some similarities between this lecture um, and the double your speed, double your fun lecture, um, which is from last year, okay? And in the double your speed, double your fun lecture, um, I show how to use helper objects. Um, this relies very, very heavily on that. Um, so this kind of builds on that lecture. If you haven't seen that one, I recommend you watch that one before this one. Um, just so that you're, you're totally caught up because I'm going to be using helper object and I'm not going to really explain or go too in-depth on what I'm doing. 
okay? So without further ado, um, let's jump into the screen a little bit and, uh, and start talking about animating with tempo. So here we have, I'm just going to start in Sketchbook and I'm going to give you a few concepts before we get into um, Maya. Um, one of the first things that I want to point out is the idea of communication and the idea of how we actually um, uh, communicate our ideas through animation. All right. So here's the first uh, 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 concept that has to do with animating with tempo. I have a keyframe here and a keyframe here and a keyframe here. Okay, and so these are stepped keys. All right. Oops, make that go all the way. Okay, so these are stepped keys. Now my stepped keys, when you look at these, what do you see? You see three very sort of distinct choices. And indeed, that is kind of what stepped keys um, are. They're, they are choices because Maya is not interpolating. There's nothing in here, okay, that Maya has put in. It's only your choice, your choice, your choice showing up on screen, okay? So because it's only, it's 100% your choice, then we have the potential for 100% communication, right? Because communication, it takes a, a, a sender, Okay, it takes a sender, it takes a message, okay, and it takes a receiver, okay? If your message is getting uh, basically adulterated, then we, we start losing communication, all right? And this is, this is very, um, this is, it's kind of getting very philosophical, but bear with me because it, it, it definitely applies, okay? So this is 100%, the potential for 100% communication. Now, how clear your choices are, each one of these keys, that will determine um, how well you are communicating, okay? Now, um, looking, at, looking at this, what happens when, um, immediately, when you spline this? Let's say you just click spline, and this is what Maya gives you, all right? What if this section right here was supposed to be a moving hold, and then it very, very quickly goes up to another moving hold, and then you wanted to anticipate and then overshoot this a little bit and come in here, okay? Look at the difference in the communication Okay, you can basically fill this in, and this is the difference of the communication that you were trying to get and what you actually got. All right, these disparate curves illustrate exactly what I mean when I say that when you're animating with tempo, and this is the first concept, when you're animating with tempo, you are preserving as much of the signal as possible. Okay because of the choices that you're making, all right? And another way to think about it is the signal to noise ratio when you're animating with tempo is as high as it's going to possibly be, all right? Whereas if you're animating straight ahead with splines like this, then the signal to noise ratio is gonna be really, really, really poor, all right? If none of this makes sense to you yet, don't worry, I will explain it, we'll get into it and, and, and things will happen. All right, but the first thing you do need to understand is that every single one of, well, well, the amount of pink or magenta that you're seeing in here is directly related. You know, that, that the amount of pink is how much noise uh, Maya is, is having come through, okay? Even if, and here's the important thing, even if your poses are perfect, your poses are absolutely perfect. Here's a perfect pose, like perfect pose and perfect pose, right? Even if you have that, you still get this noise in the middle section. You still get that. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? When, when, and this is all due to timing. You're allowing Maya to introduce noise into your thoughts and your expression of your idea, even if you have perfect poses, all right? 
And so th this immediately, and this is kind of the impetus of, of, of animating with tempo, was why are we allowing Maya so early on, like right off the bat, to uh, basically like adulterate our animation? Why are we allowing it to get in there so quickly? I like to say, I, uh, sometimes I, um, when I'm, I'm lambasting um, workflow, and uh, I'm really giving people a hard time. I like to say that, um, just, just imagine this. Imagine Maya is not a program, but it's actually a in-betweener that works at your studio. And your studio, even if it's CG, it works sort of like a 2D studio, like you know, hand-drawn animation, where the animators draw the key poses, and then the in-betweeners draw the in-between poses. Imagine Maya is this person that you would just love to get fired. Why? Because every single time you do a drawing, Maya comes along, he's like, all right, I'll do it, and then he grabs your drawings and puts them on his desk and does like just the most stupid in-betweens, like linear, boring, mechanical, like it has no life in it, right? Nothing that you want to get into, into there. No squash and stretch, no anticipation, no follow through and overlap, no uh, appeal, okay? No secondary action. None of, the, none of the principles, none of the fundamentals are ever in there. And you can't understand, how is Maya still working at this studio? How is Maya not fired? Because every single time, and why am I stuck with Maya? Can't you give me another in-betweener that at least understands the principles of animation? Your boss is like, no, sorry, you have Maya, right? You're like, ah, oh, fine, I'll work with Maya. Anyway, so animating with tempo asks, why are we letting the, the instant we make a pose, why are we letting Maya come along and, and grab our drawings like immediately? Animating with tempo means that we're not going to let Maya grab onto our drawings until there is very little chance that Maya is going to screw it up, okay? We, we remove Maya's ability to mess up our animation and then you're animating with tempo. And what I'm, what I'm going to propose is that the way you do that is you f identify those extremely key moments that are going to define your timing and then you exaggerate it, okay? Because Maya also, just by default, is going to kind of you know, buff things down. It's going to remove a little bit of your pizzazz no matter what, okay? And we're gonna do that on a shot. All right, so one more time, let me just go through the concepts that we've already talked about. The first is that when you are animating, normally you are making choices. And even if your choices, you're making choices in, in posing and you're also making choices in timing. But even if your poses are perfect, we're allowing Maya to come in, to rush in and introduce all this noise. All right, and I propose to you that rather than be so concerned with getting the pose in the right place that it's a much better thing to do to um, get as quick as you can to that inspiring timing and then work the poses into your your animation okay the inspiring timing now this could this could be construed to kind of clash with my workflow like my very first workflow lecture in which I say it's a lot better problem to have to have really awesome poses that are not like really hard to work into your timing than it is to have like totally smooth timing but um, all of your poses are not working totally smooth timing but it doesn't clash and here's why totally smooth timing and, and floaty animation and just like swimming swimming objects is not inspiring timing okay so the 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 timing that I'm talking about accessing and having your poses kind of take not a back seat to, but kind of like, like take one step back while you work this out and then they, then they come back in. Um, th the timing I'm talking about is like the best timing, is like the most inspiring timing for, for the shot, okay? So let's jump into Maya. You're gonna recognize the shot. Um, it's because at Collabs, um, what I decided to do was to, in order to start everybody off learning Pipeline, 
to create basically the uh, the extension of my flower sack shot that I did in my previous workflow lectures. So the idea is the flower sack arrives, that's my shot, and he sees the wall and he decides to try to jump over the wall, but he fails. And then after he fails, then everyone else animated a shot and he fails over and over and over and over again um, until he makes it up on the wall and I won't give away the ending, but it's very cute and I'm going to be posting that up online um, in probably a few days um, when, when my shot's done and it'll be all cut together and it'll look fun. Okay, So this is the shot where he arrives and I had to re-block the end of my shot because in my shot, if you remember from the workflow one, two, and three lectures, he arrives and then he takes a step back and he jumps and he lands sort of halfway on the wall and then he sort of wiggles his way up on top of the wall. I didn't want him to get on top of the wall. I wanted him to fail. So I had to re-block the end of the shot. Um, so let's, let's start there. Let's start from the re-block and I'll tell you um, how and when I'm transitioning my workflow to just what it was to animating with tempo. Okay, so let's take a look. <clears throat> okay, so here is the uh, flower sack shot. If you remember, let me just constrain my my uh, my timeline here. Okay, so if you remember, he lands. Let me go from the beginning. He lands sees the wall, looks at it, and then he gets ready, and then he jumps and he's about to go. So in the beginning, or the, in the first version of this shot, he, he actually made it up on top, okay? So this is what I'm going to do instead, all right? When you get to a moment that is extremely important for your scene, um, and it's, it actually really helped, I'm kind of cheating because it really helped that I had to re-block the end of this shot, but you, if you can imagine that I'm blocking this for the first time, all right, I'm going to use a helper object, and this is why I also said, here's my helper object, I already animated this one, um, but it doesn't matter because uh, I'm just going to hide it and we're going to do it again, okay? Um, this is why it really helps if you watch the double your speed, double your fun lecture before you see this one so you know what I'm talking about when I say helper object. Okay, so we're getting to this point, and we already have like kind of like finished animation, but just imagine that we're blocking this section of the, um, the um, animation. Let me, let me, um, I gotta delete the visibility key. There we go. Okay, all right, so he's all crunched up and he's about to jump off. All right, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create my helper. My helper is going to be um, in general, you know, the same size as as my my character, okay? And and really what this is going to do is going to stand in and really show me how my character is going to um, move through the scene. But when I, when I say animating with tempo, what we first have to identify is what are those moments that are the moments that we can't do without. If you remember, in a bouncing ball, let me, um, let me make a new layer here. If you remember in a bouncing ball, if you have three keys, right, like this, there is a parabola that will go through, you know, these, um, uh, these three keys, right? So we fill this in. But in the way we fill it in is we imagine that it actually, you know, slows into this top and slows out of it. Right, so that there is a you know a, a nice sort of you know ease in and out at the top there. That's how we imagine it. But think of if this was timed so that really there there would be no no ease in or out. Then you would say to yourself, oh well that's that's crappy. That doesn't look good at all because the animator didn't give enough time. Even if these were stepped keys, okay, like this. You, we'd be able to imagine this. If it's not timed correctly, then we get no inspiration from it. In fact, it, it, it just ends up looking bad, okay? So let's go back to Maya, and so that, that's what I'm going to start to do, is I'm going to see these are the pivotal moments. I'm going to go through, and I'm going to really be um, a stickler for only putting in the pivotal moments, but exaggerating them in timing, okay? So, 
um, let's let's um, key my helper object here. Now remember your helper object, like it's it's really a bad idea if you just have it. Um, uh, if, if, if it's like rigged and like there's like this extreme amount of, uh, I'm going to enable stepped preview by the way. Um, step preview is really, really helpful. Um, a great tool to use. Um, but anyway, what I was saying was it, it's really like go, defeats the purpose if like you rig your helper object and whatever. You really just want to um, break down your character into like its component pieces and, and not really worry about um, um, anything else, okay? So I'm going to um, just um, set this first um, key here. Okay, and I'm going to key the visibility on, and I'm going to key it off. Okay, so it just appears. Okay, now let me do the same thing on the visibility of this guy. Actually, it should be on this one. Just going to do this. Okay. Keep that. Keep that. Okay. So, what's the very first key that I need to define this jump up and hitting the wall? And then coming coming back down, right? It's the key on the on the wall. It's actually the contact pose, isn't it? Okay. So that's the first thing I'm going to do. I'm going to roll forward. Doesn't matter just yet which one I, what I choose. But I'm going to roll forward. And I'm going to put him. I don't know why I determined it was a he. But I'm going to put him uh, on the on the wall here, squished as well. Okay. And then, what's the next one? Going back to here. The next one that is the, the minimum amount, like you have to have three points. The minimum amount is that, is that third one, isn't it? Okay, so I'm going to actually key him right back where he was. Okay, I'm just going to copy this key, middle mouse drag and hit S. Okay, and then back down. So, if I watch this back, I should be able to, with just at a glance, with a just really quick, you know, kind of, um, you know, uh, just like cursory off the cuff and your instincts here, you really have to start developing your instincts. Learn to trust your instincts and, and don't second guess yourself, okay? So I'm just going to play this back. This is the first, I, I just animated in front of you so you know this is the first time I've animated, you know, this particular choice and we're going to see what that timing um, is doing. Okay, so it's obviously extremely fast. It's obviously way, 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 way too fast. So I'm just going to work the timing of these essential keys right now. That is animating with tempo, okay? Animating with only the tool of timing um, at your disposal. You see how I'm not worried about the pose. I'm not worried about what this flower sack is going to look like. I'm only concerning myself with how the, um, the helper object really actually is moving. So I just made a timing change. Okay, I'm thinking that we're going to need a little bit more time, but not too much more time, okay? Because I really want them to splat into the wall. So I'm going to add about three frames there, I'm going to add about three frames there. Here we go. <clears throat> okay, I feel like that is um, pretty cool, okay? Pretty cool. But now, now I need to start adding breakdowns. My, my choice here is, do I add the breakdown, is the first breakdown that I add the one that's right here, or is it the one that's, that's up here? Like meaning, do I add one that is going to basically um, show how fast he gets off the ground, or am I going to animate the one that shows how plateaued the arc is up here? Um, and this is a very interesting question, and this is why I'm going to uh, stop right here with the demo and kind of explain this. There, those are two very distinct moments, right, in, in that bouncing ball. One breakdown tells you sort of the energy and the speed of it off the ground. The other one tells you how long does he stay in the air, okay? And I'm going to ask you right now, pause the video after I, I, after I do this 
uh, after I uh, ask this question, pause the video, think about it, and then um, hit play and see if your answer is correct, okay? If I'm animating with tempo, meaning if I'm animating by going successively down the list of the keys that are the most important to the least important in terms of timing, only in terms of timing, from most important to least important, what is the next breakdown that I'm going to put in, okay? Pause the video, but then those are my two choices, a breakdown of him off the ground or a breakdown of him um, um, sort of near the top, okay? Now think about it, pause the video, and then um, come back, and I'll, I'll give you one second to think about it. <clears throat> okay, the answer is I'm going to do the one at the top. And I know half of you are like, oh, damn it, all right? And here's where I think you went wrong. You may think that the timing of him, and just the timing, the timing of him popping off the ground is more important because it shows kind of the energy of the scene and really like how much momentum he has going up. But we get that, we get that choice for free with the one at the top. Why? Because the timing of the one at the top will tell us how hard he had to push off in order to get there. All right? So, like, if you're, in the, if you're floating in space, I'm going really weird now. I'm going way out there. I'm going to space. All right, you're floating in space, all right, and a comet goes by. And if you have the speed of that comet and the direction, you know, they can, like, NASA scientists, can tell, you know, like how, where it's going to be in like 800 years, like 67,000 revolutions of, of the planet or whatever. That's how, like, th that's how much, you know, j like the, the speed and the timing of an object that's already in motion, that's how much we can tell about the origins of that object, okay? In fact, well, I, I won't go even more into it. Let's come back from space now. Okay. So let's look. So at the top, all right, so if I define this arc as being really plateaued, and I love plateaued arcs. Mm, I'm so into them right now. It's like a fad for me. I can't stop. Um, if I define this as a keyframe, then let me, let me go back. Check this out. Oops, that's not the eraser. How do I erase in my life? Freehand, okay, there we go. Let's go back, okay? If I just put this breakdown in, in fact, let me, let me take this one out, okay? Right now, we have, all right, let me do it on a new layer, just because <laughs> it's getting a little bit messy. All right, so we have a key down here, we have a key up here, we have a key down here, okay? And right now, these are all um, stepped, okay? So what I, what I get right now is this, all right? But our brains can fill this in, all right? If I go like this, all right, it not only defines basically the top of this arc, how plateaued this thing is, but it also, just because it has to get here in time, for this, it also defines this energy, okay? So very, 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 I know it's specific. I know it's it sounds incredibly like picky. Like, wait, can't you do the one on the ground and then do the one in the air? I propose that by choosing always to do the, to animate the timing in the most inspiring way possible, that you will get to the most, uh, the best animation that you that you possibly can. You could get there. You could make the same choice ostensibly by doing that breakdown off the ground, and it's tempting to. Why? Because it comes right after. You know, he squishes right. So, and and I've done this too. I've I've sat here, and I've been like, okay, well, let's have him pop off two frames later, right? You know, really stretched. Let's just do this pose. You know, shooting up like that. You know, let's do that, great. 
but I, I would say that it is far more likely, like a million to one more likely, that you're going to end up making a different choice, however slight, a different choice for the timing of that off the ground pose, okay, than you are, and spacing as well, but um, mostly the timing of that off the ground pose when you have defined the most important timing um, uh, first. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to delete this, all right, and I'm just going to define the top of this arc, okay, in timing, all right. So where do I want this to be? I'm going to say that probably I want it to be pretty plateaued. So maybe a, a, a pretty plateaued arc. Um, how many frames is this, by the way? 160 to 167. So it's seven frames up, seven frames down. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, seven frames up and down. And um, I would say that if I plateau it, if it's two frames on either side for the, the very top of that arc, that that would be pretty plateaued. But here's how we go even more. We ex always exaggerate when we're animating with tempo. Okay? So let's go here. Okay? I'm, gonna, I'm just going to zero this. I'm not zero this. I'm going to make this nice and even again. I'm just going to check the volume. 2.89, 2.79. Okay. All right. And I'm going to go um, kind of close to the, the position here. And then I'm going to go uh, three frames forward. One, two, three. And I'm, going to, I'm basically going to move him right back there with tempo. All right, and then he slams down. Now watch, um, maybe I can demonstrate the difference. Um, but see if you can imagine as you're watching this now uh, what I'm talking about. When he, if you only had the breakdown of him popping off the ground and you didn't have this plateaued uh, uh, definition of the timing up here, just imagine how different your perception of this animation would be. Just imagine how different this would be. So let's watch this. And one of the things you have to do is you have to make a change and then you watch it. You make a change and then you watch it, okay? You have to know if you're being inspired by the timing by watching it and asking yourself straight up, am I inspired right now? Was that a good choice? I, say, I repeat this often. I probably sound like a broken record to you guys by now. But I repeat this often. I say, when you are, when you are like getting to be a fantastic animator, which I know you all can do, you will realize and, and be relieved by this, this the, the discovery that it's not the, the, the workflow of, a, a, of the best animator in the world is never one perfect step in front of another. It takes so much longer to make a perfect step than it does to, to try 10 steps and to pick out the best one, okay? The best animators in the world are the best editors in the world. They know how to get really quickly to a great idea and then do another one, and then do another one, and do another one. Because all of you can pick out the best animation among three, right? You all vote on the 11 second club and there's 197 you know, animations you know, every single month on there or 250 or something, astronomical, right? So you can judge animation. Imagine if your own animation was what you were judging and you weren't so caught up trying to animate perfectly because this needs to be the best shot I've ever done. So obviously every single thing I do needs to be perfect, right? Throw that out. You're going to animate the best thing you've ever animated when you have animated the most number of iterations of it. Even if they're, they're, they're rudimentary, like this little you know, helper object, even if it's rudimentary, if, it's, if, it's, if you've done five or six different ideas for it and then you pick out the best one, it'll end up being your best animation. All right, so let's watch this. Here we go. Okay. All right, so this timing, 
I don't know if there is something better. So let's just be a little bit adventurous. And here's the thing, I'm using the um, timeline right now, much faster to use the dope sheet for this kind of thing. So I would definitely use a dope sheet when you're, when you're animating with tempo uh, on, your, on your helper object, okay? So the dope sheet is very simple. Basically, all you have to do is um, select the keys. Where are the keys? Here they are. All you have to do is select the key, and it'll, um, you can middle mouse drag it around. It's a lot quicker than shift clicking on the timeline, and then you have to shift click on uh, deselect. It's really a pain. Okay, so I'm just going to use the dope sheet for this. Okay, so um, I already moved this one. Let's move this one. So now I'm giving. This is insane. I gave myself two frames for that. Um, uh, for the pose that was after this. Now look at this. Two frames would be one frame before this pose now, right? So there we go. Already, and I don't, I don't know if this is. I haven't even watched it yet. We can't judge it until we see it. But I, don't, I, I like. How can you argue with the fact that you wouldn't have made the same choice if you uh, had animated the 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 bottom pose first, right? How can you argue that you wouldn't have made a different choice? I don't see how you can. Okay, let's watch this. I like that. That so far is the most inspiring. Now let's just go stupid and and uh, move it again. No, see that didn't work. One frame difference, all the difference. All right. Now I want him to bounce and basically land on his butt and flip backwards. Basically go head over heels and then land on his belly. Okay, so he's going to land on his back right here and then he's going to bounce off and then basically his heels will go over the top and he'll rotate and then he'll land on his belly. Okay, so I'm going to make that, I'm going to do that choice, I'm going to animate uh, that same thing with the, with the same you know, ideas that we're, we're already talking about, okay? So, where are my points that I need to define on that, right? Where are the most important first? Most important first, okay? Um, those, because those are the ones I'm going to do, okay? So, I'm going to go maybe frame 180. What happened there? Try to default it, there we go. I'm gonna go frame 180, I'm going to move I'm going to move here with tempo, okay? And I'm going to go 185, all right? And I'm going to move here with tempo, all right? All right, now let's look at this just for timing. And it's a very different way, I understand. A very different way, and you may be already saying to yourself like, <laughs> right? That's fine if you're saying that. But I think that uh, for at least a, uh, a certain number of you, you're going to say like, huh, what if I wasn't caught up with, like, first of all, what if you weren't posing 85 different controls on every single keyframe that you have to set? What if, all right? Please check out the, um, the W Speed W Fun lecture because um, it will help you out um, with that problem. But also, ho I hopefully, uh, I, I mean, I, I hope that you are also asking yourself, what if I could get the timing of my entire shot done, basically, and the best, the most inspiring that it could possibly be before I even like import my character? How dope would that be? That'd be so sweet. Okay, so let's watch. Okay, this is feeling too fast. What I want is I want a very, I want a very uh, plateaued arc up here. I know I'm like a broken record. I can't stop. Uh, the plateaued arcs are just like they're killing me. So I'm going to um, select this key. I'm going to move here with tempo. Move on. Okay, I think let's let's go crazy. Let's make this an insanely long uh, moment in here. It's so, that is so inspiring to me. Boing. 
Oh, so cool. There's gonna be some time in there. All right, now, we already answered this question, so it's kind of cheating, but I'm gonna ask you again, what's the next uh, key that we're going to um, put? All right, it's gonna be that breakdown at the top. We're gonna to define the timing of that, that plateau, okay? So let's, um, let's go four frames, don't you think? Let's try four frames. So I'm gonna move here with tempo. I'm gonna move here with tempo. And um, you'll also notice that I'm not concerning myself too much with um, what the arc actually looks like. Like, I don't know if these are the this, this exact same, um, you know, Y uh, uh, position. This one looks a little bit lower. Now it looks a little higher. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. All it has to do is be close enough that your timing choice is clear, not your pose choice. And spacing also, uh, it's always, always important. Like, it has to look like a plateau, but it doesn't have to look exactly like a plateau. So here we go. Oh, that's cool. You know what, this is giving me a discovery. And this is the best part about animating with tempo is that when you're inspired by the timing, you get new ideas. New ideas in pose, all right? So here's what I'm inspired to do now. I didn't think about this before, but I want to give him enough time. Check this out. So he's gonna land and he's gonna pop back up. I'm gonna give him enough time in air that we get a clean read of him swinging his arms and legs. All right, I, didn't, I probably didn't have that much time before, especially on a four frame, you know, or eight frame plateau, basically, four, four forward and backwards. I probably didn't have enough time. But now, now I feel like I, I definitely want to give him enough time. So let's give him one more frame on either side, and I think that will be enough to make it so that he can kind of like wiggle in air. Nice, awesome. That there's, de there's plenty of time in there for sure, okay? Um, that's going to help out a lot. All right, so this is now what I'm going to do, okay? Because it's a helper object, all I need to do is kind of, um, kind of uh, give myself a little bit of an indication of how that rotation is working as well. The, the position of the character in, in world space, very important, but also I want to define the timing of the rotation. Split them out. Imagine that he's not moving at all and he's just doing a somersault like in position. Do I want it to be like he starts it slow and then finishes it? So it kind of like has this like ease into this like quarter turn and then fast out or do I want it to be even the whole way? All right, and imagine superimpose that this timing choice or this one um, on a arc, and you'll see why you have to think when you're aiming with tempo about the timing of every single major movement um, separately. Okay, I think that probably it will be so that we can get a clean read on that rotation. It will be a good idea for us to have him um, rotate quickly and then finish it out. So it's almost a plateau in the rotation as well, all right? So I'm going to um, just, um, just kind of set a little bit of a key that shows the rotation. And then he needs to be all the way over, okay? Maybe a little bit past, and then lands. Okay. All right. So I'm going to deselect. You can unfortunately, you, it kind of gives away the form when you can see the the um, the edges. So I'm going to deselect so it just looks like it's rotating. All right, so it doesn't look like it's 
you know, scaling weirdly or whatever. So here we go, let's watch again. So now this is, now we're looking at the timing of that rotation. Here we go. Okay, you know what? Um, this is, I think we can do better. I, do, I really do. I think that having it um, kind of slow in and then like um, whip around at the top is distracting. So, um, and I think it'll be just as funny if his head is down and his, he's cycling and kicking, so it's a little bit more even. So I just made that one change to the top of this right here, and it's a, it's a lot more even, I think. All right, so let's watch this one. Okay, cool. Now, I want him to, you notice it's sort of a hybrid straight ahead approach, um, but also um, we're using step keys, so inherently we're getting a pose to pose look with a, with a kind of a straight ahead approach. But we're only animating also all kind of we're also doing it in layers as well this is like the most hybrid workflow i've ever had but um any rate here's my point i i want him to also when he lands i want him to have just a little bit of a bounce okay and and slide Okay. All right. And now we need to define, I know this seems really, really like minutia, but if he bounces and he lands right here and then he gets, this is the end of his slide, how do we define the timing of that? Well, we need to do a breakdown somewhere right here where he's almost at the position, almost at that end position. Okay. Okay, here we go. Let's watch this. Okay. All right. So, now is the moment of truth. Now what we do is, because we've defined just those moments, now we get to go back and we go down the list. So we had those essential like those three points right and it's with every single it's with every single action like an arm swing uh, somebody somebody uh, uh, jumping somebody you know uh, punching whatever every single action it has those you have to identify those essential keys and you put those in first okay you define the timing of those first all right more so than the posing okay um, all right, so then what we do is we have, uh, we, we step one ladder rung down, and what are the breakdowns that we haven't put in yet? Those would be the, the ones that are the timing of the exit, you know, from the ground. All right, so we can go back and we can find those, all right? So here he is. I didn't give myself much room, right? But... Um, let's 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 see. Let's see if um, if two frames in the air or one frame in the air is uh, is best is better. Okay. All right. So see how there here's frame one, two, three. So there's two frames in the air. Or do I or do I delay this and make it one frame in the air? Let's just look at this first choice and make a decision uh, make a decision then. Okay, here we go. I really like that, but just because it takes one freaking second, let's look at the other let's look at the other choice instead. Okay, here's one here's one frame in the air. Now it's too fast. 
It's too fast. Okay, great. All right, now same thing. Now do we have him two frames in the air on the way down? Probably symmetrical is going to be the, the order of the day. So I'm just going to copy this one. Oops, where is it? Oh, it's this one. Delete that one. Okay. You know what? We need even more time in the air. Oops, I was moving the wrong thing, was I? So that that would be two frames. One, two. Oh no, that'd be three frames in the air. Okay. Here we go. All right, this is feeling just like way too uneven. There we go. Okay, let's do it for the, the, the second bounce. So I think he'd probably be on the ground for two frames. Let's copy that and And then two frames back. You see that? Boing. And I'm so looking forward to this long middle section, this huge plateau in the center here where he's, you know, kicking and, and reaching and trying to, you know, land back on the ground and then boom, right on his, his belly. I'm very look, much looking forward to that. All right. The very last thing that we can do is we can add one more breakdown in uh, the top here to further define the um, the plateau okay so this is the first moment when I'm going to start looking at the translate Y of this object to make sure that the uh, plateau like really is a plateau okay and so as you can see right here you know it really is okay so but I'm going to set a key um, and here's a little trick that you can use to take advantage of Maya's you know, the way that everything is interpolated anyway. If you turn off Enable Step Preview, and then you, you get actually a plateau, you can set two keyframes, enable it again, and then you're right back where you were. So then you can really actually define this, this, um, this plateau nicely. Okay. I want it to be nice and plateaued. Even more in Y. All right, see how plateaued that is? All right, and see how plateaued this is? It really works out. But I wouldn't say that there's enough, enough keyframes up here to really need to define the timing up here anymore. Okay, so here we go. Let's watch this one more time. Cool. And in fact, if we're going down the ladder, if, you know, we're going to the like the next, m the next most important timing. Let's um, let's go two frames back and forth from from here as well, and uh, and and define this. Right. So just doing a little bit more definition on that uh, on that. Uh, um, what do you call it? That uh, plateau, but. I have a feeling that timing wise, we're going to need to actually spread this out to make it even more like insanely plateaued. All right. 
In fact, let's do it on both of these. I know that I've done it on both of these, so I, like this in terms of the timing choice and like getting this, you know, keeping this in my head and, and, and looking right, you know, I'm not worried about this being coming too much to keep track of, right? Because I know I, all I did right now was just change the timing of that breakdown on the, on the plateau at the top, um, one frame, you spread it out one frame. Let's check this timing. Okay. I don't think it was necessary in the second one, but I did like it in the first one. Okay. Now, um, what we can do is, because the Z arc was interrupted, we can turn off Enable Step Preview again, go into Translate Z, and delete those. Okay. Go back to, um, uh, sorry, set a key. If you hit, um, middle mouse and then hit I, it'll set a keyframe and then we can go back to step preview because the, the Z was all messed up on that first one. Not so much on the second one though. Um, and I don't think that what we did was actually necessary on the, on the second one. So let's go ahead and um, find the second one that we did, which is right here. <clears throat> oh wait, um, no, I wanted to just put this timing, this timing back the way it was. Okay, now for, for me, this is unmistakable, unmistakable for um, the, the, the timing of the character that I want to be in this, um, this shot. So um, that took me, you know, with demonstration, talking through what I was doing and a little bit of the uh, sketchbook that um, times out to 51 minutes. Okay, so a lot of that was the explanation. A lot of that was um, stuff that um, you wouldn't be doing. So I would say probably, you know, cut all down. You know, that would be about a half hour. A half hour to get to the best timing choice for the moment that I want to animate. And then all I do is I fill in the blanks. It's like tracing after that, or it's like a coloring book. Sure, I have a rig and I have to manipulate it and move it around and make it fit within the timing choices that I, I, I set with that helper object. But really, when you, when, you, when you think about it, how much time, how much more time would it have taken you to pose your character um, and try to get your character poses all working uh, before you even, even thought about timing, before you even thought about it, okay? So I wanted to reiterate one more, th one more time that although at a glance this seems like this um, contradicts what I've been talking about in terms of getting, you know, you always, it's a better problem to have to have really strong poses and not be able to time it than to have like, you know, like beautifully swimmy animation and just wishy-washy poses, all right? This doesn't conflict with that because what this does is this skips over that entire argument between pose and timing and says, you know what? Maya is going to screw up your timing way before it screws up your posing. Why don't we animate with that, uh, that importance in mind instead? Okay, that's animating with tempo. That is choosing, to, choosing a, a, a timing with tempo, okay? So my, uh, my, uh, my thoughts are is that, you know, for some of you, this is going to be a re revolutionary moment. I hope this is an aha moment for a lot of you. I'd love you to try it out. I'd love you to work on it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to save this scene. I'm going to give this scene to you because you already have it from the workflow walkthrough lectures. And I want you to just go through, open up the dope sheet, make your own timing choices. All right. See if you can come up with one that inspires you even more. All right. Um, but for the most part, this should be applied um, in the very early stages of your shot. And um, check out the uh, W Speed W Fun lecture if you want some help with the helper objects, okay? This has been a lot of fun. I really hope you enjoy this. I'm going to be talking a lot more about tempo um, in the lectures to come. It's going to be, it's, it's part of my new workflow. And, um, and, and there you have it. You've, you've seen my workflow change. I, I know I've been talking about workflow for years on this site. Um, there you, you just witnessed a workflow change um, in me. 
and uh, I hope it inspires one in you. This has been a lot of fun. If you want to send in uh, topics for my future lectures, there is a forum called the Resource Wish List in the forums on KennyWare.com, and uh, I really appreciate getting uh, lecture topics uh, suggested in there. And also, I also I have to remind you that, to send in Ask Video Mail questions because those really do drive the site and is the best way to uh, get the most out of your subscription here. So it's been a lot of fun. I'm Kenny Roy. Thanks a lot and good luck with your animation. As always, rock on.